Thank you, Rabbi. My home has been uh, destroyed on Saturday. Saturday, October 7, is the worst day in the history of the State of Israel. It's worse than the first day of the Yom Kippur War. It's worse than anything we knew during the Second Intifada. We lost on one day more than 700 people. This is almost, you know, it's more than half of the casualties in the five years of the Second Intifada. It's more casualties than the first day of, uh, than the first week, sorry, not day, the first week of the 1973 war. I live in Kibbutz Nachal Oz, a beautiful community that is located directly on the border with Gaza. My wife and I moved there in 2014. Last year, we bought a home in the Kibbutz. And in that new and beautiful home, we were sleeping on, sun on Saturday morning. When at 6 a.m., my wife, Miri, uh, woke me up and said that there is a whistle. A whistle is what you hear when a mortar is in the air and it's about to land. And I heard it. Uh, we ran to what we call the safe room. In every house in the border communities, there is a room that is built of massive concrete that is supposed to withstand direct hits by mortars or rockets. Most families, like we did, turn that room into the children's room so that they can sleep safely if there is an attack. We ran to the safe room and we heard something that was chilling. We started to hear gunfire. At first it was a bit distant in the fields outside the kibbutz, which border directly on Gaza. But then it got closer and closer. We could hear now it was from the road into the kibbutz. Now it was from the neighborhood. And then it was outside our window. The gunfire was directly outside our window. And then it was inside the house. They were shooting rounds of ammunition into our home. We did not know if the terrorists were inside the house or just right next to it. We were locked with the girls inside. Those did be locked from inside. And I can tell you that in many, many homes in our kibbutz, lives were saved because of this. Because in our home, the terrorists never entered. Our home was locked, all the windows were shut, all the curtains were down. They shot a lot of bullets into the house, but they did not manage to enter. In other homes, they managed to enter and people were locked in the safe room and the terrorists tried to open the door, shoot at the door, but they could not enter. However, unfortunately, in other homes, I don't know how and why, they were able to kill, injure, and kidnap members of our community. We were barricaded inside and I called my father. My father, Noam Tibon, is a retired military general. He's a friend of the reform movement, if I can say, all of our family. He was in Tel Aviv and I told him, the terrorists are here, they're outside our door. And he said two words, he said, I'm coming. When all of this was happening, my wife and I were asking something incredible and unbelievable from our two young daughters. We were asking them to listen to us and to believe us that they cannot talk right now, that they have to be absolutely quiet and silent. No talking, no crying. They asked if they can go outside to play in the living room. We said no. They asked if they can go eat in the kitchen. We said no. They asked to go to the bathroom, we said no. And they had to put their faith in us that we were not just insisting with them like parents sometimes do, but that there was a real reason for this. And they put their faith in us. My girls were the heroes of this day. For 10 hours, they were silent in a dark that we are alone. And I prepared to die. Um, I did not think we could be rescued, but the one hope I had was maybe somehow my father at some point will arrive. My parents started driving from Tel Aviv. I learned only many, many hours later what happened to them on this dark day. At first they arrived in the area of Sderot and they saw people running barefoot away from the scene of the music festival. They took them in their car toward the safe place outside of the line of fire. They arrived at a nearby community 
קיבוץ מפלסים. My father um, teamed there with one brave soldier who agreed to come with him to Nachal Oz and try to fight the terrorists in our neighborhood who were entering houses and trying to kill people. The two of them drove toward Nachal Oz. My father had only a pistol. He's retired. He's over 60. And while they are driving, they see ahead of them an Israeli military jeep being ambushed by a Hamas cell and fighting. They stopped the car. They joined the brave soldiers of the Maglan Special Forces Unit and they killed the terrorists. Some soldiers were killed in that ambush. Others were wounded. And my father, now very close to the entrance to Nachal Oz, minutes away, took the wounded soldiers in his Jeep and turned around and went back to where my mother was waiting to bring her the wounded soldiers so that their lives could be saved. And then my parents decided to split. My mom took the wounded soldiers in her car, two of them, to a hospital. And my father saw another retired general, Israel Ziv, who is older than my father even. I think he's closer to 70. But he woke up that morning, he put on uniform, and he went down south to try to save people. And my father told him, Israel, I need help. I don't have a car. My wife took the wounded soldiers in my car to the hospital. Please take me to Nachal Oz. I need to go and save my family. I need to go and save other people in that kibbutz. And Israel Ziv, in an act of extreme selflessness, decided to risk his life and drive my father to Nachal Oz on the same road where there was an ambush before in a regular car. They made it. And in the entrance of the kibbutz, my father saw a group of uh, soldiers from the special forces. They recognized him. They, they knew he was a former general. He had a gun by now. One of the wounded heroes gave him his gun and his helmet. And they started to go from home to home in the kibbutz to engage the terrorists and to free the people who were sitting in the safe rooms for now, it was seven, eight, nine hours. We had no idea this was happening. At this point, we had no cell phone reception anymore. We're just sitting in the dark and waiting. And we started to hear the intense gunfire and the exchange of fire from different kinds of weapons. You could hear the noises. And that's when I told Miri, my brave wife, that my father is, is coming. He's in the kibbutz now. They were going from house to house with this incredibly courageous group of Maglan soldiers. They killed six terrorists at least. They freed people from the kibbutz. Um, some people were sending me text messages that my father is there, but I could not see it because we had no phone at this point. The last hour in the safe room was the, the most difficult. The girls had fallen asleep and then they woke up. And by then it was very dark. The little, little tiny bit of light that had come in through a crack in one of the walls was no longer there. And the girls, they, they had not ate anything since last night. We only had water with us. And they really wanted to get out. And the only thing I could tell them that kept them behaving and quiet was Saba Baderech, grandfather is coming. They listened and we waited and we heard the gunfire and we prayed for all our neighbors. And at 4 p.m. after six, after 10 hours, we heard a large bang on the window of the safe room. And we heard my father's voice and Galia, my three and a half year old said, Saba Egea, grandfather is here. This is when we cried for the first time. Our home became the temple.